fashion changed often throughout history and across cultures, however few fashion changes were as radical as those of the past century or two. Take men's hairstyles for example nowadays it is the norm for men to keep their hair short, but that is a recent development, throughout much of history, long hair was fashionable for men. Or take the association of the color pink in women, well into the 1920s there was nothing girly about pink, and men wore it without raising eyebrows. We owe the modern association of pink with girls to a popular first lady. Below are 20 things about those and other fashion history facts. Long hair for men used to be the fashion norm. Short hair as the fashion norm for men is historically speaking, a relatively recent development. Throughout much of history, men in many cultures wore their hair long, or at least longer than the average for men today, for men to have their hair cut short was often seen as a sign of subordination to another's control. Be that another person or society, short hair was what rankers wore in the military, what prisoners endured in captivity, or what was inflicted upon miscreants as a criminal punishment. To the ancient Greeks, for example, long male hair was a sign of wealth, power, and manliness. Greek gods had long hair and so did Greek soldiers. By contrast, a shaven or shorn head was the mark of a slave. The Spartans ancient Greece's most formidable warriors, took special pride in their long hair, the heads of boys in training were shorn close, but once they reached puberty, they let their hair grow long, before they engaged in battle, the Spartans combed, dressed, braided or twisted their long hair into dreadlocks. Early Roman Republic men also wore their hair long, until the introduction of barbers in Italy triggered a fashion shift to shorter male hair in the late Republic and throughout much of the Empire, in Middle Ages Europe, Short male hair signified servitude and the peasantry. Upper-class men usually only cut their hair short for purposes of penitence or mourning. So when did fashion shift to short male hair as a widespread norm? The switch to short male hair In the English Civil Wars 1642-1651, to long hair became associated with the royalist cavaliers, while shorter hair became associated with the pro-parliament roundheads, the linkage of long male hair with aristocrats, and short hair with commoners got an even bigger boost during the French Revolution. To distance themselves from the Ancien Regime, men adopted fashions radically different from those of the aristocracy. Also in the 17th and 18th centuries, long male hair came to be associated with adventurous and wild types, while shorter hair came to be associated with the state and stolid. The decisive shift towards short hair for men began in the second half of the 19th century, and war played a key role. In the Crimean War and the U.S. Civil War, the association between lice and disease, and diseases were bigger killers back then than bullets was noted. Soldiers cut their hair short for purposes of health and comfort. Many men took that army camp fashion back home with them upon their discharge from the military. The figure of the soldier as a masculine ideal reinforced that trend. The Industrial Revolution boosted that shift in the workplace, as long hair could prove dangerous around machinery. By the turn of the 20th century, short male hair had become widespread. That norm was reinforced even further by World War I, and the terrible sanitation and hygiene conditions endured by millions of soldiers in the trenches. Short shorn or even shaved off hair was effective against endemic lice infestations. By the 1920s, short hair had firmly established itself as the male fashion norm, especially in the West and cultures influenced by the West. How pink became a girly color Historically speaking, pink as a feminine color is a relatively recent fashion development. In 1918 for example a popular American catalog recommended that little girls were blue, because it was dainty and delicate. In 1927 Time magazine conducted a survey of major department stores to find out which colors were commonly associated with girls in their clothing lines. The results were mixed and pink did not stand out as a fashion choice for girls well into the 1920s. Pink was worn by men and women alike. It was not until after World War II that pink developed the symbolic association with girls that we have today. The biggest driver behind that fashion development was First Lady Mamie Eisenhower at the 1953 inauguration. The new First Lady came out in an enormous rhinestone-studded pink ball gown that won great admiration. Mamie Eisenhower loved the color pink and the country loved Mamie, she wore pink so often that a casual search of Mrs. Eisenhower's newspaper coverage frequently finds references to pink either in the headline or the article. And it was not just pink but Mamie Pink. It did not take long before the notion spread that pink is what ladylike women wore. In the 1957 musical romantic comedy Funny Face, 
For example, the lady editor of a fashion magazine breaks into song about how women in America today have to think pink. By the time Amy had left the White House, pink was a popular color not just for female clothes, but also around the house as a favored women's decor choice. Fashion and choice of clothing used to mark rigid social divides. In the days before the French Revolution, what people wore in their choice of clothing served as a visible marker of aristocratic privilege and social status. In the Middle Ages and well into the early modern period, for example, sumptuary laws reinforced social hierarchies and regulated what people could wear, based on their social rank. Ancien regime France's high fashion was derived from the French court's dress code, in accordance with rigid norms of etiquette introduced by King Louis XIV. In the 18th century, as the French court and government grew increasingly corrupt and outdated, the fashion associated with the regime came to be seen by the enlightened as outmoded symbols of corruption. The fashion divide was at its most obvious in the early days of the French Revolution, when the king was forced to call the estates general and assembly of the aristocracy, the clergy and the commoners. The aristocrats of the first estate were clearly marked by their extravagant coats, cloaks, and vests, embroidered with gold, breeches, and powdered wigs, and expensive hats adorned with feathers. The clergy of the second estate was dressed in elaborate robes of purple, red, and gold. Everybody else in the third estate was dressed in plain suits, with white shirts and simple hats. That stark disparity visible to all and sundry, would have a major impact on the future of fashion. The French Revolution revolutionized not only politics but fashion as well. The French Revolution was a great upheaval on multiple levels, the great changes it ushered in were not limited to the political landscape of France, Europe, the West, and eventually the world. They also extended to fashion. When the Ancien Regime was overthrown, and as the Jacobins and Radicals came to dominate the revolutionary ranks, a backlash developed against high fashion, the extravagant sartorial choices and elaborate clothing styles prevalent, in the days of the Ancien Regime were out, because of their association with royalty and the despised aristocracy. They were replaced by a new trend that could be seen as anti-fashion, in opposition to all that came before. The new styles emphasized simplicity and modesty for both men and women. When the revolution was at its highest fever pitch, fashion ceased to be an expression of individual taste. It became an important political statement that could mean the difference between life and death, and to ignore that could be dangerous, to continue to dress in the elaborate fashions of the Ancien Regime, was a surefire way to mark the wearer as suspect, and probably worthy of a date with the guillotine. Out with the elaborate fancy schmancy, in with the simple and state. In revolutionary France, the extravagant fashion and styles of the despised nobility came to be seen as expressions, and symbols of counter-revolutionary intent. As such the revolution sought to suppress elements of dress associated with the aristocracy. Expensive silks, velvets and other pricey items of clothing were prohibited, as the revolutionaries set out to create a new order marked by fraternity, rather than privilege, thus in the midst of the reign of terror, the workaday outfits of the sans culottes, without breeches, the common people of the lower classes, came to the fore. The new and simpler styles were seen as symbols of revolutionary egalitarianism, the revolution in fashion was permanent, the revolution itself went off track, and the revolutionary regime was replaced in turn by the Directory, the Consul at the Empire and finally, a restoration of the monarchy after Napoleon's defeat. However the extravagant fashions of the Ancien Regime did not return, breeches did not make a comeback, and the elaborate powdered wigs and feathered hats for men were consigned to history. From cool youth fashion to uncool geezers. Today the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, HAMC, does not carry the kind of cachet it used to once upon a time. Especially among the modern era's young motorcyclists, Hells Angels no longer come across as dashing dangerous types whose gear makes a cool fashion statement, Instead they come across as aging or aged unkempt bikers who ride around in overpriced and underperforming Harley Davidsons, however although they might no longer be dashing, they're still dangerous, the US Department of Justice sees the Hells Angels as a crime syndicate. With members often involved in violent organized crime, extortion, prostitution, narcotics, and the traffic in stolen goods, some countries have banned Hells Angels chapters or even the entire club, strange as it might seem, the world's most infamous outlaw bikers began as innocent World War II veterans groups, 
In 1940 Harley-Davidson began to make a limited number of motorcycles for the U.S. Army, production skyrocketed when America joined the war the following year, known as Harley-Davidson WLA Liberators, they had 739cc displacement, 3-speed transmissions, 23.5 horsepower and could do 65 miles per hour. From camaraderie to outlawry. The U.S. Army ordered more than 90,000 WLA Liberators during the war, along with spare parts that were the equivalent of many more. Different models were also produced for the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, and a WLA variant known as the WLC, was made for the Canadian Army. When peace returned, the military began to sell surplus Harley-Davidson's dirt cheap, and they were snapped up by returning GIs. Some veterans formed innocent motorcycle clubs that eventually morphed into not-so-innocent biker gangs. As happens after most wars some World War II veterans had trouble readjusting to civilian life, some suffered from what we now know as PTSD, some wanted to recapture the war's adventure and adrenaline rush, and some were just plain bored, some formed motorcycle clubs, and rode together mostly in military surplus Harley-Davidsons. At first it was just about camaraderie, but it eventually became a fashion and lifestyle statement. From there it did not take long before some of the veterans' motorcycle clubs gained a reputation as outlaws. The rally that got it started. Bad boy cool biker fashion began with a 1947 American Motorcyclist Association, AMA, sanctioned rally in Hollister, California. It started off innocent enough, but soon morphed into an out of control biker ride that ravaged the town and gave rise to the iconic biker outlaw image. The incident's roots go back to the 1930s, when the small town of Hollister began to host an annual 4th of July motorcycle rally known as a Gypsy Tour. Such tours were innocent affairs that typically revolved around social activities, motorcycle races, and parties. Gypsy tours were cancelled during World War II, but in 1947 Hollister let it be known that its annual motorcycle rally was back on. Unfortunately the good people of Hollister had not reckoned with the dramatic increase in motorcycle popularity, or the changed demographics of motorcycle enthusiasts. The small town was about to host thousands more bikers than it had expected. Many of them differed greatly from the wholesome motorcyclists with whom the townspeople had dealt in the pre-war years and that they were younger and rowdier. As seen below the result was chaos. Post-World War II bikers were a different crowd than pre-war ones. Hollister's 1947 Gypsy Tour kicked off on July 3rd, and before the small town knew it, it had been flooded with about 4,000 bikers from across America. The new arrivals instantly doubled Hollister's population. Never in the pre-war days rallies had so many people participated. And Hollister was unprepared for the flood of guests. They included groups with colorful and to innocent 1940 sensibilities, Sinister names such as the Pissed Off Bastards of Bloomington, the Boost Fighters Equals and the Market Street Commandos. At first Hollister's bars welcomed the bikers and the business boom they brought with them. Soon however drunk motorcyclists were racing up and down the streets, while bar-wrecking brawls erupted in the drinking establishments. Because Hollister had not expected so many visitors, a housing problem developed. By July 4th bikers were sleeping on sidewalks, haystacks and on people's lawns. Hollister's seven-man police force was overwhelmed. They tried to end the chaos with the threats of tear gas and by arresting as many drunks as they could. 11. The riot and movie that gave rise to this kind of cool bad boy fashion. Try as they might, the authorities' efforts to maintain order in Hollister proved fruitless. The chaos only ended when the Gypsy Tour ended and the bikers headed back home two months after the Hollister Gypsy Tour. The same biker clubs descended upon Riverside CA for the Labor Day weekend. It was another AMA-sanctioned event, and it ended in the same chaos that had engulfed Hollister. Riverside's sheriff blamed punk kids and stated that, they're rebels, or outlaws. That established the imagery of outlaw bikers. The Hollister ride in particular inspired 1953's The Wild One, starring Marlon Brando. It was the original outlaw biker movie, and the first to examine American motorcycle gangs. It also made biker fashion the height of bad boy cool. A few months later in March 1948, some of those clubs came together in Fontana CA and agreed to merge. They chose a name suggested by a veteran who had served in China with the Flying Tigers Hell's Angels Squadron, which got it from the 1930 Howard Hughes movie Hell's Angels. When questioned about the missing apostrophe, Hell's Angels often retort, it is you who miss it, we don't. An uncomfortable joke about a fashion company's past. English comedian Russell Brand got himself kicked out of a GQ magazine's Man of the Year Award shindig in 2013, 
when he cracked jokes about the event sponsor, Hugo Boss and its Nazi ties. As Brand put it, if anyone knows a bit about history and fashion you know it was Hugo Boss, who made uniforms for the Nazis, but they looked foo king fantastic let's face it, while they were killing people on the basis of their religion and sexuality. Understandably Hugo Boss's executives were not thrilled that all they got for the £250,000 they had spent to sponsor the event was another dose of bad publicity, about their company's Nazi past, whether Russell Brand's humor was in good taste or bad, he was not wrong about the fashion designer's Nazi ties. Today Hugo Boss is a global luxury fashion brand, famous for its flashy ties and classic suits, it had about 1,100 company-owned stores worldwide as of 2019, and about $4 billion in sales. As seen below, there is quite a bit of darkness in the company's background. The man behind the snazzy Nazi fashion There was a time when it seemed that no yuppie was cool unless his wardrobe contained Hugo Boss shirts, suits, socks, sunglasses, cologne, and man thongs. Less cool was the history of the company's founder, fashion designer Hugo Ferdinand Boss, he was an enthusiastic Nazi who devoted his talents to making Hitler's goons look as snazzy as possible, he founded a textile factory as a family-run business in 1923, and one of his early big contracts was to supply uniforms to the Nazi party's SA stormtroopers, or brown shirts boss eventually joined the party, and that paid off when the Nazis took power in 1933. Boss's status as an active party member, and enthusiastic supporter of Nazi policies placed him on the inside track, when the new regime began to award clothing contracts. Before long the company was producing, in addition to the brown shirts uniforms, the black outfits of the SS, and the black and brown uniforms of the Hitler Youth. Production continued and expanded during World War II, but then Hugo Boss was outfitting the SSSA, Hitler Youth German Rail Workers, postal employees as well as the German Army, Navy and Air Force, that was not the worst of it. A fashion icon's use of slave workers as World War II raged on, Hugo Boss used hundreds of slave workers in his factory, mostly from Poland and France, to meet increased wartime production demands, the slave laborers' working conditions were dreadful, they were insufficiently fed, received inadequate medical care, and were made to live in insanitary barracks infested with lice and fleas. During air raids, they were not allowed into shelters, but had to remain in the factory. Those who tried to run away were sent to even more dreadful places if captured, such as Auschwitz. After the war Germans were subjected to a denazification process, and the Nazi fashion designer did not fare well, he was heavily fined stripped of his voting rights, and prohibited from running a business, Boss appealed and managed to get the penalties reduced, but the business ban remained. So he was forced to transfer ownership and management of the company to his son-in-law. In the year since Hugo Boss has understandably not been keen to celebrate its founder or discuss its pre-war history. In 1999 the company finally agreed to contribute to a fund to compensate its former slave workers. A fruit that took Europe by storm. Pineapples today are just a dolkin away, and often cost a buck or less. As such it's hard to grasp just how exotic and expensive they once used to be, when Christopher Columbus returned from his second voyage in 1496, and brought back a consignment of pineapples. Only one of them survived the sea passage without rotting, but that one was enough to send the Spanish court into raptures. One courtier wrote that its flavor excels all other fruits. To understand the reaction, one needs to think about it in the context of its era, one in which sweet things were not as common in Europe as they are today. Refined sugar was rare and extremely expensive, while fruits were only available in season, as such a ripe sweet pineapple could have been the tastiest thing that a European of that era had ever tasted, an even greater factor was the exotic appearance, pineapples looked like nothing Europeans had seen before. As one envoy of Spain's King Ferdinand put it, it is the most beautiful of fruits I have seen, I do no suppose there is in the whole world any other of so exquisite and lovely appearance, pineapples became prized status and fashion symbols, and as seen below were esteemed to an extent that seems ridiculous today. When pineapples were the height of fashion Back in the days when royalists advocated the divine right of kings, anything with a crown came to be associated with heavenly approval, the pineapple, whose spiny top resembled a crown, became a symbolic manifestation of monarchy, it soon became known as the king of fruit, but between that the vast distances they had to travel to reach Europe, their exoticism and the fact that few people had ever set eye on one, possessing a pineapple became a status symbol and a statement of exquisite fashion sense, so much so, that pineapples were used in international politics and diplomacy. 
in 1668 a French ambassador arrived in England to mediate a dispute over some Caribbean islands, England's King Charles II ordered a pineapple from the English colony of Barbados perched atop a fruit pyramid at a dinner feast in honor of the French envoy, contemporaries saw it as a public relations triumph, which asserted English dominance in the region, the move visually illustrated that England's naval supremacy meant that, the English could get pineapples from the Caribbean at will, while the French could not, from then on the pineapple, which Charles II christened King Pine, became his favorite status symbol, he even commissioned a painting in which the royal gardener presents him with one. Ready availability cratered this fruit's value as a fashion statement. By the 18th century, pineapples could be grown in European greenhouses, but only at great expense, in the ballpark of $15,000 in 2022 dollars, to eat them was considered wasteful, though it became a fashion to use them as fancy dinner ornaments, they were passed from party to party until they rotted. People who were not rich enough to own pineapples but wanted to look like they were, rented them from shops that sprang up to cater to their social climbing needs, pineapples were expensive enough to warrant security guards, and for good reason. For example 1807 Old Bailey transcripts show several pineapple theft cases, including one of a Mr. Gooding who got transported to Australia for seven years because he stole seven pineapples. In the 19th century, steamships became ever more reliable, and their ever bigger cargo holds meant that pineapples could be shipped to Europe in bulk, the resultant availability of pineapples at ever lower costs lowered their prestige, and cratered their fashion cachet. For the upper classes, the once exotic tropical fruit had been a marker of status, now the notion that pineapples were available and affordable to all and sundry gold the snobby set, cartoons of working-class people eating pineapples were used in satirical prints, visual metaphors of the downside of progress in what seemed to the elites as a topsy-turvy world. The Nazis used fashion to turn children into monsters. The Third Reich committed too many crimes to count, not least among them is the mass indoctrination of innocent German children, to turn them into brainwashed and hate-filled cogs in their monstrous machine, in 1922 the Nazis established a youth arm to recruit, indoctrinate, and train members for its paramilitary, the storm troopers commonly known as the brown shirts, as the party grew in numbers and power, so did the size of its youth arm, which was renamed the Hitler Jugend or Hitler Youth in 1926, when the Nazis gained power in 1933, they made the Hitler Jugend Germany's sole official youth organization. The new regime took over and folded pre-existing youth organizations into their own, and Hitler appointed a Reich youth leader to oversee the takeover, however not all German children willingly accepted the fare fed them by the Nazis, and some of them adamantly refused to just go along, through a mixture of youthful courage, and teenagers being teenagers, some sought to express their individuality through a teen lifestyle and fashion that bucked the system, those kids who defined themselves in opposition to the Nazis, came to be known as the Edelweiss Pirates. The Indoctrination of Children The Nazi youth organization was divided into the Hitler Youth proper for boys aged 14 to 18, and a junior branch for boys aged 10 to 14. German girls from ages 10 to 18 were placed in a parallel organization, the League of German Girls. Youngsters were taught Nazi doctrine, and encouraged to report those who went against it, including their own parents if they criticized Hitler or the party. Children were also taught to link those designated enemies by the state, such as Jews with societal decline, and with German defeat in World War I. Fittingly for a totalitarian regime, the Hitler Youth was an all-encompassing and immersive experience. Children imbibed Nazi ideology, racism, speech and fashion, eventually membership became obligatory, the parents of children who were not signed up fell under suspicion, and were often questioned or otherwise harassed by the authorities, in the meantime children were subjected to peer pressure, and ostracism by schoolmates and teachers. It worked at the end of 1932, the Hitler Youth had 108,000 members. By the end of 1933 the Nazis' first year in power, that number had shot up to 2,300,000. By December 1936 there were more than 5 million Hitler Youth. A Dark Version of the Boy Scouts In December 1936 membership in the Hitler Youth was made mandatory for all Aryan youth. In March of 1939 children were conscripted en masse into the organization, regardless of whether their parents consented or objected, in 1940 a year into World War II, the Hitler Youth were reorganized into an auxiliary force to perform war duties, chapters became active in local fire brigades and in recovery efforts after Allied bombing raids, helped deliver the mail, they also directly assisted the military, such as with service alongside anti-aircraft gun batteries. 
as the war dragged on and losses mounted, Germany faced a growing military manpower shortage, so in 1943 the Hitler Youth was tapped as a manpower reserve, and a plan was approved for the formation of an SS division comprised of Hitler Youth. The resultant unit, the 12th SS Panzer Hitler Youth Division, fought in Normandy in 1944, where it gained a reputation for ferocious fanaticism. As Germany's situation grew more dire, the Nazis increasingly turned to their youth organization. By 1945 Volkssturm units, the Nazi militias were routinely drafting 12-year-old old Hitler Youth members into their ranks, as the curtain fell on the Third Reich. Hitler Youth units played a conspicuous role in the last days of the Battle of Berlin. They fought so ferociously for their namesake that only two members of a children's unit that manned the Nazis' last line of defense survived. 